It may sound unexpected, but how long could a nuclear submarine last in space? Here's a spoiler alert, not very long, but the reasons are likely to surprise you. Unlike what you might think, the submarine wouldn't just explode or fall apart into pieces. Submarine hulls are built to withstand insane pressures, between 50 and 80 atmospheres of external pressure from deep ocean water. So it's quite easy for them to contain one atmosphere of internal pressure in space. Then there's this thing. Watertight seals aren't completely airtight, but submarines can keep the water out under immense pressure. It means that air wouldn't be escaping into space too quickly. In other words, your submarine wouldn't leak air all over the cosmos. Okay, how about carbon dioxide buildup? Surprisingly, it wouldn't be an issue either. The thing is, submarines use CO2 scrubbers that can run for a long, long time, as long as there's power. But oxygen is another story. In usual conditions, nuclear subs extract oxygen from water. In general, one can easily imagine a device that will work like plants. With the help of external electricity, oxygen will be released from carbon dioxide. Overall, this doesn't seem like a big problem. But if we didn't add such special devices to the submarine, it would only have enough oxygen to last a few days. Then this supply would run out. But even before that, a bigger, more immediate threat would arise, overheating. Most people are sure that space is insanely cold, and that's partially true. But it should be noted that it is one thing to interact with something slightly cold but conducts heat well, and a completely different thing to interact with something very cold, but without the ability to give off heat to it. It's like touching metal and foam. The foam will feel warm regardless of its temperature. Space is similar. It has an extremely low temperature, but it might feel very warm. So, without air or water around to absorb and carry away the heat of the submarine, it would only be able to cool down through radiation. For normal space stations, this is not a big problem. For this purpose, stations like the ISS use special coolers that radiate energy into space. But this method is only sufficient for cooling small heat sources at space stations. But submarines generate much more heat. They simply aren't designed to operate in space. They have to cool down with the help of seawater. But in orbit, there's no water to carry away the heat. So the heat generated by the submarine, especially from its 200 megawatt nuclear reactor, would become a problem very fast. You see, civilian nuclear reactors are only about 50% efficient, which means that half of the reactor's energy is lost as heat. If the same applies to the sub, around 100 megawatts of energy would be building up as heat inside the sub. It is about a thousand times more than the total power of the ISS. Without seawater to cool it down, the sub would start heating super fast. And within an hour, it'd be too hot for humans to survive inside. And not long after that, the nuclear reactor would overheat and melt down. Now let's say you somehow managed to send your submarine into space, and now you gotta get it out of orbit. How could you do it? To leave orbit, you'd need to slow it down enough to re-enter the atmosphere. Submarines do have rockets. They are just not attached to them. So, theoretically, if you turn those missiles around and launch them in reverse, they could help slow down the submarine. But there, you'll encounter a new problem. Submarines don't have heat shields like spacecraft, and without this protection, the sub would simply burn up on re-entry. And since submarines aren't built to be aerodynamically stable at hypersonic speeds, it would start tumbling uncontrollably while re-entering, breaking apart in the atmosphere. The debris would either disintegrate in the air or crash into the ground at terrifying speeds. Could you survive re-entry inside a submarine? Unlikely. If you somehow managed to strap yourself into a special acceleration couch inside the right corner of the submarine, there would be a tiny chance of survival. But then you'd need to jump out of the wreckage, hurtling toward the ground with a parachute before it hit the ground. You'd also need to disable the missile detonators before trying this stunt. Otherwise, you'd have way bigger problems than overheating. All in all, nuclear submarines are great for deep sea missions, but absolutely not efficient in orbit. Running out of oxygen, overheating from the reactor, lacking rockets to safely deorbit, obviously, submarines are best left under the waves. Many sci fi movies can make you believe that everything happening in space is accompanied by some kind of sound effect, which is a totally false misconception. In space, no one will hear you scream. There's no air in space. It's an almost perfect vacuum. And the sound waves don't travel through a vacuum. They can't reach your eardrums and make them vibrate, sending signals to your brain. But it's a good thing, especially for astronauts on spacewalks. 
If not for the quietness of space, they would be constantly overwhelmed by the noise of solar storms. Huge space explosions sure look super impressive. Whether they're scientifically possible or not is another question. Blasts on our home planet look the way they do because of air and gravity. You see, the air functions as an oxidizer, and the outward pressure makes everything fly into the air and then collapse back to the ground. But this process is very different in space, and it looks even cooler. If a blast occurred in space, there would still be some fire despite the lack of air, because some kinds of fuels can act as oxidizers. But it wouldn't be the fire you're imagining now. This cosmic fire would look like an expanding ball of light. It would be a seemingly never-ending process due to microgravity and the lack of air resistance. Nearby spaceships would be in grave danger since the shrapnel would fly outward until something eventually stops it. All comets have beautiful long tails. Huh? It's nothing but a popular misconception. In reality, comets are very difficult space bodies to spot. They usually spend large amounts of time far away from stars. There, in the darkness of space, they remain rather inactive and completely frozen. Comets only get tails once they come close to a star. That's when they start warming up. This process makes them form some kind of a cloudy atmosphere, which is called a coma, and a distinctive tail. The tail always points away from the star that influences the comet. It happens because the tail gets blown in the opposite direction by solar radiation and solar winds. That's why the tail can often be in front of the comet, not trailing after it. The inner and outer planets of the solar system are separated by the asteroid belt a ring of asteroids and other debris and space objects orbiting around the Sun. While creating movies about space, filmmakers make sure to somehow use this region. Usually, they show the asteroid belt as an extremely crowded place with dense clouds of huge rocks you have to skillfully maneuver to get through to the other side. In reality, if you looked outside your spaceship while flying through this region of space, it would feel as if you're looking at the sky from Earth all because of the ginormous distances in space. If you decided to cross the asteroid belt, there would be very little chance of a collision with a space object. Asteroids there are really spaced out and very far from one another. Black holes are giant, scary, cosmic vacuum cleaners, they say. But in reality, black holes are more like fly traps. They don't look for things to munch on. Instead, they sit out there quite passively. Only when a star or any other object comes too close does a black hole spring into action. Even so, only those space bodies that cross a certain border get ripped apart. In fact, black holes aren't any different from any other celestial body since their pull is directly proportional to their mass. They can't swallow anything bigger than what their size allows. Even if our Sun was somehow replaced with a black hole as massive as itself, Nothing would change for Earth or any other planet in the solar system, gravitationally speaking, of course. Space battles in movies often involve using lasers. But if you were to see such a fight from up close, you would probably be disappointed. The thing is, it would be like nothing in movies. A laser beam is a concentrated burst of energy, and it could indeed be used for many purposes during a fight. But a real-life laser beam would be totally invisible in space since there wouldn't be any particles around to scatter the light and make the beam bright red or green or any other color. A human would be torn into pieces if they got into open space without a spacesuit. Well, contrary to popular belief, taking off a spacesuit during a spacewalk wouldn't be as dramatic as it's often pictured in movies. A person would just lose consciousness due to a lack of oxygen after 15 seconds of being in outer space without protection. But that's if this person breathed out as much air as possible. Otherwise, this oxygen would damage their lungs from the inside, making them rupture. After that, without the protection of the spacesuit, the pressure inside their body would drop. This would cause even more serious trouble. And even though this person definitely wouldn't burst, 
they wouldn't want to stay outside for too long. People often believe that in space you experience zero gravity, hence the weightlessness astronauts feel on the International Space Station. But that's not exactly true. Gravity is one of the most important forces that exist in the universe. Thanks to it, the Moon orbits Earth and the Sun doesn't float away out of our home Milky Way galaxy. Astronauts on the ISS do experience the effects of gravity, but that's not full-fledged. It's microgravity. The gravity on the space station is only 10% weaker than the gravity on Earth's surface, but astronauts are constantly in freefall. The spacecraft, people inside, and all the objects aboard keep falling forward, not down, but around our planet, following a specific orbit. And since they're all falling together, the crew and the stuff inside seem to be floating. That's why astronauts can move things as heavy as hundreds of pounds with their fingertips. And even though microgravity is often called zero gravity, they are very different things. A light year must mean time, right? Not really. Light years actually measure distance. NASA's definition of a light year goes like this. The total distance that a beam of light moving in a straight line travels in a year. And since light moves at a speed of 186,000 miles per second, a light year equals almost 6 trillion miles. It may seem as if the sun is always on fire. At least that's what it looks like in pictures and in movies. But in reality, our star is a giant ball of gas. Nuclear reactions happening in its core at all times make the sun burn. Every second, hundreds of millions of tons of hydrogen are converted into almost as much helium. During this process, huge amounts of energy are released as gamma rays. Then these rays turn into light. In other words, the sun does emit blinding light and incredible heat, but it's not actually on fire because no oxygen is involved in the process. The speed of light is believed to be the ultimate barrier for people when it comes to space travel, and it's often thought to be impassable. There are many theories about what it might be like to reach that speed, but none of the equations account for going above it. And still, we know that at least one thing in the universe is faster than the speed of light, the rate of its expansion. Yep, the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light, baffling astronomers and casual sky watchers alike. Or at least we can say so in terms of the speed of different objects, like faraway galaxies relative to each other. At the moment, it's not something scientists understand well. The rate of the expansion of the universe is proportional to how far something is, too. The farther it is from us, the faster it's moving away. But even though we don't get the mechanics of it yet, we've got our proof even though it's theoretical so far that some particles might be able to travel faster than the speed of light. Some scientists think there could be more things out there in space that could challenge this speed barrier. All we need to do is find them. Traveling to space costs a fortune, but there's a way to make it affordable. You step into an elevator, push the button, and voila, you're flying to the stars, all thanks to nanotubes. But then something hits the elevator on the way. You're stuck inside, and now you're doomed to float in space forever. Now, if you want to travel in space, get ready to shell out around 55 million bucks. But in the near future, you'll probably be able to travel to space with just the push of a button without breaking the bank. Because space elevators might come into play. While the idea of galactic lifts seems like something out of a sci-fi movie, it is a real possibility that could revolutionize space travel. With an estimated cost of $8 billion, space elevators could be a one-time investment that would last us forever. NASA alone spends around $2.7 million on rocket fuel per minute. To launch a rocket, they need to pay up to $178 million. These costs could be significantly reduced with the use of elevators. Most super-tall buildings on Earth have a massive foundation to help with their balance and weight. As you look up, they get thinner and thinner. Even the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa, is massive at the bottom and narrow at the top. 
If we wanted to construct something like a gigantic lift, we would need an enormous amount of concrete to build a foundation for it, which goes against the point of saving some cash. Now, get a string, tie a ball at the end of it, and start spinning it. The string in your hand will stay in one place, and the ball will revolve around your hand. This is called centrifugal force, and the elevator will work in the same way. The ball will be the base in space, and the rope will hang toward Earth. The station from where we would enter the elevator would be in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and the line would extend from there. For this to be possible, the line must be perfectly synchronized with Earth's rotation. Otherwise, it would simply break or wrap around the Earth like a scarf. Also, the orbit the line would be following should be a perfect circle, because the line wouldn't be able to get shorter or extend. A bunch of research has been done using algebra to find the ideal solution. Wait a second, there's a use for algebra? Never mind. Meanwhile, I won't bore you with the math. We'll go straight to the point where the precise distance from the station in the Atlantic to the one in space must be 22,236 miles above the Earth, where the geosynchronous orbit starts. There, the four outward forces are much stronger than the downward force. That's why the station would stay in one place. When you construct a house or a building, you start from the bottom going up. But to create this engineering wonder, we would need to do everything in reverse and start at the top. The main problem here would be the weight. If the line was too heavy, it would disrupt the orbit, and the conveyor dumbwaiter host would not work. So we need to balance the station in space to ensure it worked flawlessly. Steel is one of the most robust materials on Earth. The cable in every lift is made from steel. But when you need a 22,236-mile-long cable, hmm, things can get tricky. Steel is hard to break, but it's cumbersome. And when you have to use a lot of it, problems start to arise. We use heavy steel a lot in construction, but we have lighter materials that might put less stress on the station and eliminate this problem. Also, the line would have to be tapered because, at the end point, there would be close to zero stress but it would still have to be thicker than really needed due to a bunch of safety factors. At the start, the rope would be around 0.5 inches. After using some complicated math, we can figure out the thickness at the end, which is a number so long I am unable to pronounce it. But believe me, it's a big one. So, steel is off the list. Another candidate is Kevlar, which is five times stronger than steel. And if we added such materials as carbon and titanium into the mix, the strength would increase tenfold. The line would have a diameter of around 262 to 557 feet. This is drastically smaller than the diameter of the steel cable could be. The bad news is that doing this is too pricey. So if we don't find the ideal medium to build a cable, the idea of the space elevator will just be a massive waste of time. If only we had some magically light material with a power of 60 gigapascals, which would have a taper ratio of 1.6. Oh wait, we actually do have this unique material. It's called carbon nanotube. It has a strength of 130 gigapascals, which is much more than we need. Nanotubes are made out of carbon and are 100,000 times thinner than a human hair. This material is solid and has good conductive power, which is possible thanks to its unique atomic structure. We use this product in many things, from batteries to optics, and it can be modified entirely and adapted for more uses. Bradley Edwards is the guy responsible for this crazy idea. NASA was looking for new innovations, and they said, don't do anything too crazy and start building a space hoist. I guess Bradley took this as a challenge and started working on the elevator. Edwards wrote a paper about a galactic conveyor. When he published it, he expected many people to find flaws in his work. But surprisingly, nobody did. His work was spot on. He came up with the idea of strapping a nanotube line to a rocket and launching it into space. The other end of the rope would fall onto Earth, and robots would use this rope to climb up and make it longer so we could start building an elevator space station. After this, the elevator could start transporting everything, from solar panels to tourists. In the future, space tourism could be totally possible. Who knows? We might even go on vacations in space.
Hey, looking for some atmosphere for your getaway? Well, don't come here, we don't have any. Oops, probably not a good advertising slogan, huh? Meanwhile, a couple of years ago, we could only create microscopic carbon nanotubes. But as time went on, much more research was done to make them bigger. Now they reach up to a few inches. In 20 years, they could be miles long. Carbon costs $28 per ounce. If we do the math, we would see that we would need around $1 billion to build a lift. Yeah, it sounds expensive, but it's a long-term solution to space travel, and it can actually save us a lot of money in the long run. Now, everything looks perfect on paper. But NASA's main reason why they chose not to go along with this project is that right now, there are probably more than 128 million objects floating in orbit, and they might pose a real threat to the elevator. The lift could be made to withstand a few hits now and then, but getting hammered non-stop is not part of the plan. Still, Bradley argues that tons of monitoring devices track space debris. Thus, the elevator could avoid them all. Now, if something hit the elevator or the line somehow broke, the consequences would not be too bad. If there were no passengers on board, of course. If the line got cut, the elevator would simply float away into space, posing no threat to people on Earth. In Japan, engineers are trying to build a space elevator. The lift could be used for space mining, too. We could easily cover the cost of the entire elevator by collecting asteroids, because some of them are made of expensive metals. We could mine them and quickly bring them back to Earth. You get the last instructions from the team and get into your spaceship. It's the first spacecraft made on Earth that can move at a speed close to the speed of light. Your task is to visit the most unusual and terrifying places in space and send scientists detailed information about them. And so, your journey begins. Your spacecraft is accelerating, and you dash past the moon. In the distance, you see a small reddish planet. It's Mars. And look at that spectacular giant surrounded by a set of rings. That's Saturn! You wish you could have more time to explore this gas giant, but you have to hurry. You pass by beautiful stars. Some of them are luminous, others have a reddish hue, and some seem to be dimming. That's Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky on Earth. It's about 8.6 light years away from us, but you're traveling fast, and soon you see Polaris, aka the North Star, which is way further, 431 light years away. Sometimes you manage to spot tiny dots circling these stars. Those are planets. And then, suddenly, you see nothing. At first, you're horrified. Something has gone wrong, and you've accidentally entered a black hole? Has your equipment malfunctioned? Because it seems that at a distance of 700 million light years away from Earth, there's a hole. A blank void with no galaxies, stars, planets, or asteroids. You can't see anything. The void is a roughly spherical region of about 330 million light years across. Our home Milky Way galaxy could fit in there billions of times over. And then it dawns on you. What you're looking at is the mysterious Boats Void. It lies about 700 million light years away from Earth in the constellation of Boats, the herdsman driving the plow around the North Pole. At first, this void was called the Great Nothing, but later it was given its current name. Now we know that galaxies look like a giant web. Most of them are parts of long structures called filaments. Those wind through the cosmos, and when they meet, they form regions with a high concentration of galaxies. These regions are what we know as galaxy clusters, but between these clusters and threads, there are ginormous empty voids that hardly contain any galaxies. Such voids actually make up almost 80% of the observable universe, and most of them are huge, from 30 to 300 million light years wide. The Boats Void is one of the most massive ones. It's even earned the title of Super Void. Astronomers think it might be the result of a few smaller voids merging together. But what could have caused such giant empty areas to appear in the first place? The reason might lie in the origin of the universe. In its early days, all the matter in the universe was packed together quite tightly. 
Astronomers even think it was something like a uniform soup. But pretty soon, random quantum fluctuations started distributing this matter. Some areas became denser. As a result, their gravitational pull became stronger and they began stealing matter from less dense regions. This made such areas even denser and they kept attracting more and more matter. At the same time, smaller clumps of matter started drifting further away from the center, forming galaxies. After staring at nothingness for some time, you decide to explore other space objects and start the engine of your spacecraft again. There's one kind of space formation you've been looking forward to seeing. Nebulas. Those are gigantic clouds of gas and dust. With time, gravity starts to pull these clumps of dust and gas together. They grow larger and larger and their gravity gets more powerful. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? One day, this mass becomes so big that it collapses under its own gravity and forms new stars. So, you decide to visit some of the most beautiful nebulas out there. And you start with the Butterfly Nebula. This butterfly's wingspan is more than three light years. And the structure inside the nebula is one of the most complicated ever observed. The central star, a white dwarf, is heated to an incredible 450,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It means it was formed from a gargantuan star, likely more than five times the size of our sun. The white dwarf is surrounded by a thick disk of dust and gas at the equator. That's what probably makes the whole structure look like an hourglass or a butterfly. The next place you decide to visit is the Eskimo Nebula. 5,000 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Gemini. It was discovered more than 200 years ago and got its name for a reason. Its double shell formation looks like a person's face hidden in a padded hood of a winter jacket. But in reality, this parka is a disk of material with a ring of comet-shaped objects. And the tails of these objects stream away from the star at the center of the Eskimo Nebula. The bizarre orange streaks in the outer part of the cloud stretch light years away in all directions. As for the Eskimo's face, even though it resembles a ball of twine, in reality, it's a bubble of material blown into space by the wind of high-speed material produced by the central star. Your next destination is the Ring Nebula. At first sight, it's a giant cloud of dust and gas surrounding an old, almost extinguished star, which does look like a ring. But astronomers say the nebula isn't a bagel, it's a jelly-filled donut. The deep space colorful object more than 2,000 light years away from Earth is actually a ring that wraps around a blue, ball-shaped structure. Each end of the structure sticks out of the ring's opposite sides. Now you can head to a place called the Pillars of Creation. You find it more than 7,000 light years away from Earth in the Eagle Nebula. That's a young cluster of stars just 5.5 million years old, space babies. Once, the Hubble Space Telescope managed to take an image of several dark silhouettes near the nebula center. And now you can see them with your own eyes. Those are the so-called Pillars of Creation an active star-forming region. And since you've already visited a star-forming region, why don't you drop by a living fossil galaxy? For example, DG Sat 1. It's as big as the Milky Way, but it's nearly invisible because its stars are spread out incredibly thinly. But what makes the galaxy so unique is that it's sitting all alone, unlike other galaxies of this kind, which are usually found in clusters. It can mean that DG Sat 1 was formed in a different era, probably a mere 1 billion years after the Big Bang. If it's true, the galaxy is a real living fossil. The next stop on your space sightseeing tour is the Black Widow Pulsar. Just like its spider namesake, this rotating neutron star is munching on its partner, a lightweight brown dwarf star. The more material the pulsar consumes, the more slowly it spins. The energy the neutron star is losing in the process causes the companion star to dwindle. Oh, look at this! 
that's a stellar nursery in the constellation of Centaurus. But even though this place might be called nursery, it's anything but peaceful or safe. This region, made up of hydrogen and newborn stars, is located in a nebula in the constellation of Centaurus, around 6,500 light years away from Earth. The intense energy these baby stars emit makes hydrogen clouds glow ominous red. This energy is so powerful that it's eating away dark clouds of dust, and they're disappearing like lumps of butter on a hot frying pan. You're continuing your journey when you see something absolutely amazing, a cloud of water floating in space. To be more precise, it's a cloud of water vapor surrounding a supermassive black hole 12 billion light years away from Earth. The cloud contains 140 trillion times the entire volume of water on our planet. Astronomers believe this water cloud appeared just 1.6 billion years later than the universe itself. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We'll be ready to take off in 3, 2, 1. Living on a spaceship sounds like a sci-fi movie topic, but gradually turns into a plan for the distant future dream. Let's imagine how it would be. Without further ado, I'll start with the light. On Earth, thanks to the atmosphere, the sky scatters the sunlight, so we get light in different directions. Then there are shadows, contrast, and ambient light. In a spaceship, however, there's no sky to create that cool ambient light. When you're in a spacecraft inside a solar system, one side of the ship can be lightened by the sun or another star, and one side can stay in the shadow. You can think of it as the crescent moon. If your spacecraft manages to go far away from any solar system, you might say goodbye to the bright side of the ship you would be very far from all stars. So the ship is going to fly in the deep darkness. Don't worry though, the advanced technology will probably find a way to imitate the sunlight. Maybe designers will place LED light panels similar to windows and inhabitants of the ship wouldn't notice the difference. What about people? A study revealed that a crew of 160 people could create a viable population for 200 years. Here, the important thing is to select the crew members from a large gene pool. No two passengers should be closer than 6th or 7th degree cousins. This is a projection from our day. Who knows, maybe hundreds of years later, whole countries will live in a spaceship. Your neighbor country in the world will be your neighbor in space. This reminds me of the scene from Thor Ragnarok, when the Asgardians who survived Hela escaped with the Grand Master's ship they went to Earth to settle down. Maybe we would go to Proxima Centauri b. It's an exoplanet, which is the term used to define planets beyond our solar system. Proxima b is in another star system, and some scientists do believe it has the potential. Some of them believe that there's a possibility that liquid water exists on the surface of a planet. It's important because this planet is our nearest neighboring exoplanet. Yeah, the nearest one but it's almost 25 trillion miles away. To better understand this proximity, I'll give you a comparison. Currently, one of the fastest spaceships, called New Horizons, goes a whopping speed of more than 30,000 miles per hour. But even with this speed, it would take thousands of years to get to Proxima b. Let's hope we figure out how to warp the space-time equation by then. If I'm realistic, the first option is more likely. Let's assume we made a trip with our fastest spaceships. This would still be a couple of hundred year journey. This leads to another minor problem, the lifespan of humans. The same crew cannot make it to the end of the ride. Here, generation ships shine as a solution. A community of adults enter the ship, then their children and their children. You know, until humanity finally reaches the new planet. There are two other alternatives. If researchers somehow made a way to make people live for centuries, we wouldn't need generation ships. Similarly, there could be a system to freeze people. It'll take 20,000 people to start a healthy population on a new planet. For now, I want to stick with the first scenario. Here's how it would be to live in a generation spacecraft. Dating wouldn't be as romantic as it is on Earth. There's probably a geneticist who will regulate reproduction. 
freedom of choice in general would be decreased. The rules will be strict. In every generation, there should be certain tasks to manage. Someone should be a doctor, and someone else should be a plumber. New generations may go under a career planning test. Everyone would be assigned occupations based on their merits, aptitude, passions, and available jobs. It reminds me of Snowpiercer, but hopefully things would go humanely and better in this version. People all need water, and they'll create waste. By then, maybe we wouldn't rely on plastic. Plus, recycling may be on another level. Still, we will need water. A healthy human needs almost 300 gallons of water per year. It's not like they'll stop by on a planet and refill the water reserves. So how can spaceship residents solve this problem? There are already systems to recycle some astronauts' waste into pure water. The next issue is infirmary. A spaceship might have almost no bacteria or microbes. People need them for a stronger immune system. If they get too isolated and land on a planet, they may have difficulty coping with the potential conditions there. Shielding carries importance too. Deep space is a radioactive place. Our planet has a magnetic field that protects us from DNA frying waves. Out in the open, the spaceship will need a strong shield. Maybe we'll be able to create some sort of force field. NASA is working on systems to grow plants in space. We will probably see special sections dedicated to farming and livestock. I also feel like this type of ship would also carry flora and fauna samples too. Who knows, maybe there will be specific parks and different mini ecosystems. This would be great for the sanity of people on the ship. I mean, it's great to maintain the existence of the human race. But, um, existential crises can mess with the passengers. They can eat their space sandwiches in the park and relax a bit with the sound of tweeting birds. Not just a garden, the young passengers might need a playground and school. Well, in this case, cabins, to get an education. They'll probably have a whole new curriculum, How to Stay Alive on a Foreign Planet 101. to protect themselves from potentially hostile life forms. Once they successfully arrive, they need tools to build their homes too. When they finally arrive at their new planet, they might start advanced technology to travel around other planets. Hi mom, I brought you a rock as a gift from the surface of Mars. There could be new occupations and a live space travel guide. And we might need some type of document like a visa to enter other habitable planets. There's a meteorite rain expected, so stay at your base for the next two years, says the newscaster. Okay, okay, I'll calm down here. So how would you picture a vessel capable of ferrying humans from one solar system to another? Would it have some sort of wings, or would it look like a rocket? Tell me more about the design in your mind. This place has no time zone, no land mass, and the sun rises and sets here just once a year. For over 400 years, since the era of King Henry VIII, 
thousands of explorers from all over the world were trying to reach this elusive spot, the North Pole. Some were hoping to find a northwest or northeast passage to China and the Indies, and others just wanted to see what it was like. In 1773, the British Royal Navy organized the first scientific expedition to the North Pole. Constantine Phipps volunteered to lead the mission. It was difficult for the two ships to move through thick ice, and they had to be towed using smaller boats. At some point, Phipps was ready to leave the ships as they saw a completely frozen sea. But in the end, they broke free from the ice and escaped into the open sea to return home without reaching the goal. In 1882, American explorer James Booth Lockwood managed to get closer to the goal than anyone else. By that time, at least 750 people in 42 expeditions had lost their lives trying to make it to the pole. On the 7th of September, 1909, the New York Times came out with a sensational front page. Perry discovers the North Pole after eight trials in 23 years. Robert E. Perry, an American explorer, claimed to have reached the North Pole in April of the same year. But communication back then was slower than now, so the message had only reached New York by September. A week before the famous headline, the New York Herald had published its own front-page sensation. The North Pole is discovered by Dr. Frederick A. Cook. Cook, another American explorer, had vanished into the Arctic for over a year and had everyone convinced he reached the pole in April 1908, a whole year before Perry. It was tricky to provide evidence any of them had actually reached the goal back then. Their goal was constantly moving on sea ice, unlike the South Pole on steady land, so they couldn't just leave a flag or some other proof there. A travel diary full of details of the journey, including daily distances, the position of the stars and the like, would probably do as evidence. But neither Cook nor Perry were able to provide any of this backup information. So each of them started a campaign to prove they were honest and trustworthy. Perry was mentioned as the North Pole discoverer until 1988. That's when the National Geographic Society revisited the evidence and found that his records really didn't prove his claim. Cook's claim was neither proven nor disproven. Australian-born British explorer Sir Hubert Wilkins went on his first expedition to the North Pole in 1913. That's when he got the idea to reach the goal by submarine. In 1931, he borrowed a special submarine named O-12 from the U.S. Navy. The future mission had two goals – to do scientific experiments while floating on ice and moving underwater, and to reach the North Pole by traveling beneath the ice. They planned to study the weather, take temperature measurements, and collect water samples from both the surface and the sea floor. The submarine Sir Hubert used was brought to a shipyard in New Jersey to be modified. They added the latest scientific equipment and changed the outside so the submarine could travel under the ice. On March 16, the submarine left the shipyard to start its journey to the Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York. But even before leaving the Delaware River, they faced delays. A snowstorm forced them to stop at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and they had to stop again to get more fuel. When the submarine was entering New York Harbor, a crew member who was just 27 years old fell overboard and drowned. The submarine was officially renamed Nautilus, and the grandson of Jules Verne, the author of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which inspired the new name, was there to see it. Before starting their journey, the crew tested the Nautilus in different spots off the New England coast. They faced criticism and were already two months behind schedule so they decided to head straight to England. During their trip across the Atlantic, they sailed into severe storms. On the 13th of June, the starboard engine broke down. Then, the port engine failed because it was overused. While crossing the Atlantic, Sir Hubert Wilkins kept radioing the submarine's position back to the United States. After both engines failed, they sent out an SOS. On June 15th, the USS Wyoming, a huge ship on a training cruise with naval students, reached the Nautilus. The Wyoming towed the broken submarine to Queenstown, Ireland, and then it was taken to Davenport, England for repairs. They had to wait for spare parts from the United States, which caused more delays. Once the Nautilus was fixed, they headed to Bergen, Norway, to meet the submarine science officers and get more equipment. One of the most important additions in Bergen was a diving chamber. 
which allow them to lower scientific tools into the water through a special hatch. On August 5th, the Nautilus finally left Bergen and headed north to find ice flows. They had lots of delays because of mechanical problems and storms. One storm even made the submarine tilt at crazy angles. Finally, on August 19th, they saw the first ice flow. For a few days, they followed the ice's edge, looking for a good spot to dive. Three days later, they tried to dive under the ice, but discovered that the submarine's diving rudders were missing. One diver went overboard to check and saw that someone must have broken off the rudders on purpose. This made Wilkins think that someone on the crew had sabotaged the submarine because they didn't trust the mission. Even without the rudders, Wilkins still wanted to do some of his scientific experiments. On the last day of August, they found a way to force the Nautilus under a 3-foot thick ice floe. They had to fill the ballast tanks and adjust the trim. They managed to make more dives under this ice this way before the journey ended. After a few more days of trying to do research, Wilkins decided it was too dangerous to stay at sea. The Nautilus arrived at Svalbard, the Norwegian archipelago between mainland Norway and the North Pole, on September 8th, after going through the worst storm of the trip. They planned to go to a port in England, but another storm caused a lot of damage and made the engines fail, so they had to stop in Bergen again. After getting permission from the United States Shipping Board, the Nautilus was towed out of Bergen and sunk in a Norwegian fjord on November 13, 1931. In 1958, a U.S. submarine with the same name, Nautilus, became the first vessel that reached the North Pole by traveling under the ice. This Nautilus was much bigger than the submarines that came before it. It was 319 feet long and weighed 3,590 tons. For comparison, the other Nautilus was 175 feet long. Unlike other submarines, the new Nautilus could stay underwater for a longer time because of its special atomic engine didn't need air and only used a tiny amount of nuclear fuel. On July 23, 1958, it left Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on Operation Sunshine. There were 116 people on board, Commander Anderson, 111 officers and crew, and four civilian scientists. The Nautilus traveled north through the Bering Strait and only surfaced once at Point Barrow, Alaska. On August 1st, the submarine left the north coast of Alaska and dove under the Arctic ice cap. The submarine traveled at a depth of 500 feet, with the ice above it between 10 to 50 feet thick. At 11.15 p.m. on August 3rd, Commander Anderson told his crew, For the world, our country, and the Navy, the North Pole and the Nautilus went right under the North Pole without stopping. On August 5th, the submarine came up in the Greenland Sea, and then, two days later, it finished its historic trip in Iceland. On the 6th of December, 1941, disaster struck the British submarine HMS Perseus. It hit a mine while patrolling the Mediterranean. The ship quickly sank, taking almost all of its 59 crew members and two passengers to the bottom of the sea. Unbelievably, one passenger, John Capes, managed to escape this underwater tomb. Capes' story was so incredible that for more than 50 years, many doubted that he had even been aboard the submarine, let alone survived such an ordeal. Capes' adventure began earlier in the war, when he got into a car accident with a horse and cart in Malta. Before the matter was resolved, he was called back to serve on the submarine HMS Thrasher. In September 1941, Capes was granted leave to return to Malta to deal with the accident. Malta was under heavy siege by German and Italian forces, so Capes had to be smuggled onto the island by the Magic Carpet Service. It was a secret operation that used British submarines to move supplies and personnel across the Mediterranean. A few weeks later, the man was ready to leave Malta and hitched a ride on HMS Perseus, one of the Royal Navy's largest submarines. It was headed to Alexandria, Egypt, with a mission to patrol the waters off eastern Greece. On the night of the 6th of December, Capes was relaxing in his makeshift bunk at the back of the sub. The Perseus was sailing on the surface to recharge the batteries. Suddenly, a massive explosion rocked the submarine, plunging it into darkness. It nosedived almost straight down. Water started flooding in through a large crack in the submarine's bow caused by the mine. 
Thrown around and slightly injured, Capes grabbed a flashlight and started searching for survivors. He made his way to the engine room. It was filled with debris and bodies. Luckily, the bulkhead door was closed, holding back the sea. But the pressure was immense and water was starting to leak through. Amid the wreckage, Capes found three injured crew members and helped them back to the rear compartment. He then shut the aft watertight door. Capes found four special oxygen rebreather vests and helped the crewman put them on before donning one himself. The depth gauge showed they were 270 feet below the surface. That was way beyond the safe operating limit of 100 feet for the vests. In reality, the gauge was wrong. They were actually 170 feet underwater, but it was still a dangerous depth. For the escape hatch to open, the inside pressure had to match the outside. They had to flood the compartment. Capes tried to open the starboard bilge valve, but it was jammed. So he opened the breach of the submarine's underwater flare gun, releasing a gush of seawater that slowly filled the compartment. Once it was flooded and the air pressure equalized, Capes managed to undo the bolts on the escape hatch. The hatch flew open and Capes guided the men one by one through the opening before following them out. The water was dark and murky. Capes knew he had to ascend slowly to avoid bursting his lungs due to the pressure. During the ascent, the pain in his chest grew worse with every breath. But just when he thought he wouldn't make it, he broke the surface. Using his flashlight, Capes searched for the other men, but found no sign of them. In the distance, he spotted some cliffs and began swimming toward them, using his rebreather as a makeshift life vest. Hours later, Capes was washed up unconscious on a beach beneath the cliffs on the southern coast of Kefalonia. Fishermen from a nearby village found him and hid him in a cave. For the next 18 months, the villagers risked their lives to care for Capes, moving him from place to place to keep him hidden from the occupying German and Italian forces. Finally, on the 30th of May, 1943, Capes was smuggled on a small fishing boat to Turkey. He made his way to the British consulate and was eventually taken to Alexandria, Egypt. Capes returned to Royal Navy service and later received the British Empire Medal for his heroic escape. He retired in 1950. Capes' story was so incredible that many people didn't believe he could have survived such a wild ascent. Some skeptics even thought he was an imposter. But on the 26th of December, 1997, Greek divers found the wreckage of HMS Perseus. The cracked bow confirmed the submarine had hit a mine, and the aft escape hatch was open. Further dives didn't help find any bodies in the stern compartment, but many other finds confirmed Capes' words. Twelve years after John Capes had passed away, which happened in 1985, he was finally vindicated. In 1845, two ships, HMS Terror and HMS Erebus, set sail from England to find the Northwest Passage, a crucial sea route between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Captain Sir John Franklin was leading the expedition. He was a seasoned polar explorer who had already tried twice to find the passage. Everything looked promising, but the journey ended in tragedy. Both ships disappeared without a race, along with 129 crew members, making it the worst disaster in British polar exploration history. Numerous missions set sail to find the Terror and Erebus, and many relics from these searches are now in the National Maritime Museum, reminding us of Franklin's doomed voyage. So what really happened to the crews of the Terror and Erebus? In May 1845, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror left Britain for Nunavut, northern Canada there was great hope that they would finally chart the Northwest Passage. John Franklin, who had already made two attempts, was eager to succeed. By the standards of the time, the Erebus and Terror were advanced ships. They had heating systems and vast supplies of preserved foods. In late July, a whaler spotted the two ships in Baffin Bay, waiting for ice to clear so they could continue to the Bering Strait. That was the last time any of the 129 crewmen were seen alive. After two years with no word from Franklin's mission, the Admiralty sent out a search party, but they found nothing. In total, 39 missions went to search for the ships to the Arctic. 
By the 1850s, some clues began to surface, but the exact fate of the men still remains a mystery even today. The men on Franklin's expedition faced extreme conditions. Even removing a balaclava could tear the skin from your face in the bitter cold. No one has found any journals or logbooks from the ships yet, but other sources give us an idea of the crew's struggles. Expeditions set off in spring to cover as much ground as possible before winter set in. The Arctic was a harsh and unpredictable environment. The crew encountered freezing fog, heaving seas, and the crushing pressure of sea ice. Franklin's ship got stuck in ice in a desolate area the Inuit rarely visited, so they couldn't rely on local help. However, they had supplies for about three years and were experienced in surviving Arctic winters. Temperatures could drop as low as minus 54 degrees F overnight. Conditions on board weren't much better. Luckily, Franklin's ships had heating systems that may have provided some comfort. The men were regularly checked for scurvy, which was a constant threat due to the lack of fresh food. Scientific observations were a key part of the mission, but the cold made them dangerous. Metal instruments could stick to the skin, and sweat could freeze, causing frostbite. Hypothermia was a constant risk, leading to confusion and unconsciousness if it wasn't treated in time. Franklin's ships got trapped in the ice near King William Island. In 1847, a party traveled across the ice to leave a progress report at Point Victory. It's believed they reached Cape Herschel and completed the Northwest Passage charting. Sir John Franklin passed away in June 1847. The ships, still trapped, drifted south until Captain Crozier ordered their abandonment. Weakened by starvation and scurvy, 105 survivors headed for the Great Fish River, but most didn't make it. In 1859, a crucial piece of evidence was found in a cairn, a mound of rough stones on the northwestern coast of King William Island. It was called the Victory Point Note. The first message had been written on a special pre-printed admiralty form in May 1847, and that's what it claimed. 28 of May 1847. HM ships Erebus and Terror wintered in the ice. Having wintered in 1846, seven at Beachy Island, after having ascended Wellington Channel to lat 77 degrees and returned by the west side of Cornwallis Island, Sir John Franklin commanding the expedition. All well, party consisting of two officers and six men left the ships on Monday the 24th of May, 1847. The second and final part of the note was written largely on the margins because of a lack of remaining space on the document. It was likely written in April, 1848. The 25th of April, 1848, HM ships Terror and Erebus were deserted on the 22nd of April, five leagues nado you of this, having been beset since the 12th of September, 1846. The officers and crews, consisting of 105 souls, under the command of Captain F.R.M. Crozier, landed here. This paper was found by Lieutenant Irving under the cairn supposed to have been built by Sir James Ross in 1831, four miles to the northward, where it had been deposited by the late Commander Gore in May-June 1847. Sir James Ross's pillar has not, however, been found, and the paper has been transferred to this position which is that in which Sir J. Ross's pillar was erected. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847, and the total loss by deaths in the expedition has been to this date nine officers and 15 men. James Fitzjames, Captain HMS Erebus, Crozier, Captain and Senior Offar, and start on tomorrow, 26th, for Baxfish River. Traces of Franklin's first winter camp were found in 1850, but his fate remained a mystery. Urged by Franklin's widow and public concern, the Admiralty sent more expeditions. Still, there were no answers, so the British government offered a substantial reward for the news 20,000 pounds. At that time, high-ranking government officials, doctors, Oxbridge teachers, and lawyers received about 1,000 pounds per year at the beginning of their careers, and renting a two-room apartment cost about 80 pounds a year. Over 30 years, 
Relics like tin cans and snow goggles trickled back to Britain, telling a tale of scurvy and starvation. In 1981, forensic anthropologist Dr. Owen Beatty found high lead levels in the bones of some crew members, suggesting that lead poisoning from the tinned food was one of the main factors of the crew's demise. The expedition's tinned food, stocked in abundance, was likely contaminated by lead solder used to seal the tins. During later research on Beachy Island, Beatty and his team recovered and autopsied three remarkably well-preserved crewmen who had passed away during the expedition's first winter in the Arctic. When the scientists examined the tissues collected from the men's bodies, they managed to confirm Beatty's earlier theory that lead poisoning had been one of the factors leading to the expedition's destruction. Even more terrifyingly, there were traces of dismemberment on the crewmen's bones, which were likely a sign of cannibalism. In 2014 and 2016, the wrecks of HMS Erebus and Terror were finally discovered, shedding new light on Franklin's expedition. Underwater archaeologists and the Inuit Heritage Trust continued to reveal fascinating finds from these wrecks.